Howdy, folks. Hopefully everybody's doing okay. Welcome to uh, Postgres 12 All Demos Edition here at Open Source Summit. Uh, like I said, I hope everyone's doing okay. We're settling in. I'll give folks a couple of minutes to join in. Uh, whatever. Move their cats out of the way. Whatever life troubles that you have when conferencing at home. Um, hopefully uh, everyone's having a good day. I think this is like pretty close to the last session on the last day. Um, I'm not sure, like I know at a normal open source summit, I feel like usually at that time my brain is completely melted. It's a different experience here doing this at home. So uh, hopefully it'll go well for everybody and won't have too many issues. Um, as a little bit uh, way of intro, uh, so this talk is gonna be mostly about new features in Postgres 12. Uh, it's generally designed, it can be very interactive. So if you want to, you know, send uh, sort of questions or comments or whatever as I'm going through it, that's probably fine. Uh, it's a little bit of a new setup, so hopefully I'll see it all and, and we can make that work. Um, but the idea behind the talk essentially is uh, we're, we're going to show you features of 12, things that are new in 12. And I think in many talks that you see that kind of a thing, you know, it's just kind of a series of slides and whatnot. Uh, showing different features and how they work. Um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to see if we could do something that was a little more interactive. So I'll show you. I've got sort of demos that are available, and you could actually do this yourself if you wanted to. Um, by getting, you need a Postgres 12 uh, in order to do it, and then there's a sample database that we have, and I'll show you some links to that in a second, and then a demo script. So. Uh, the demo script is freely available, you know, open source and whatever. Um, so if you later want to go through and do these yourself at home uh, or, or whatnot, you could do them at home and, and that'd be fine. Uh, and you can play around with it. That's how I find is kind of the best way to do this kind of stuff is to, to play around with it. Um, so uh, so we'll go ahead. Uh, and the way this is going to work also, I guess, just so you're aware, I'm going to hit the magic screen share button and then we're going to go into... Uh, a series of terminal windows. Uh, it is It is actually that. So there's going to be, I wouldn't say there's a lot of code necessarily, depending on your background, um, but it is like stuff in terminals. We're going to try it that way uh, for this particular edition uh, and see how well this works. Hopefully this works well uh, and, and everyone can see everything and all of that kind of stuff. So um, I guess one thing, if you want to shoot uh, which angle you're coming from, this is a mix of stuff for developers and DBAs and people just working with Postgres. So uh, it covers a little bit of the map. And now, honestly, we probably won't get to everything that's in that demo script. Like, it's pretty long. So, um, again, if we don't get to something you want to see, it's available publicly. You can go back through it and, and see how it works. So uh, why don't I hit the button and we'll get into the terminals, and then uh, I will keep talking and, and we'll start on our path here. Uh, all right. I think that's the one. All right. So what you should see, uh, move the cursor around here. So you should have a terminal windows. Um, what's new in Postgres 12, the all demos edition. Again, I'm Robert Treat. Uh, you can find me on Twitter if you have questions later or need help. Um, at RobTreat2 is a good way to, to track me down. Um, like I said, requirements wise, uh, we're using Postgres 12, so any Postgres 12 will do. Um, I'm using, I guess it's probably 12.3. I keep a, a demo version that I compile on my uh, on many of my computers, but in this particular case, it's just on my uh, desktop here. Um, so, but any 12 will do. It should work whether you're on, uh, you know, anything we're gonna do here. There's one or two maybe that, that might have an issue, but uh, if you're using RDS, that's fine. You know, or some other cloud thing. Uh, that's fine. I think any Postgres 12 doesn't really matter what platform you're on for for 99% of the stuff. Uh, that should work fine. Um, I mentioned there's a sample database. Uh, it's a database called the Pajila Sample Database. Uh, it is on my GitHub, which is GitHub.com Exila Pajila. And what this is is basically it's it's a sort of features oriented sample database uh, used to showcase features of Postgres and different things that are out there. Um, and, and work like that. So, uh, you can go ahead and download that. Um, and then, uh, you know, see what's in there and, and there's a script in there. It's basically modeled after an online DVD store, uh, that type of thing. Actually, and I've learned today that that's still a thing. Um, 
I used to say like, you know, if you're of a certain age, you wouldn't remember maybe what DVDs were. Uh, but actually, as it turns out, if you go to dvd.com uh, and look at, at that, it'll redirect you to Netflix's old DVD by mail business. It's a thing I just learned. So if you can imagine this is that kind of a thing. There's films and movies and actors, and I'll show you some of the tables as we go through it. Uh, and then, like I said, the, the demo script is publicly available. If you go to exilla.net uh, slash postgres12demos.html, that will redirect you over to a gist, uh, and it's actually all in one one big gist. So um, you can see what we're going to do there. And this is actually the script here that I'm in right now. So there's a table of contents, and then all of the different features are laid out, uh, and you can look at those and, and see what's in there. So um, and these other windows, uh, so this one here is we're going to use. It's going to be Postgres 12. Uh, and as you can see, PSQL is 12.3. Uh, so like I said, that's the latest version. Uh, mine is pretty compiled. It doesn't really, if you had 12.0 or 12.1, that would be fine as well. Any 12 should work for this stuff. Um, and so I'm doing a little bit differently here for this one, just because I figure it's always nice to up the ante when you're doing these live demos. Um, I've got a window down here, which is actually Postgres 11. Uh, and some of these demos, actually, it's nice to be able to look at a Postgres 11 and see how that behaved versus what you're going to see in Postgres 12. Um, so we'll do a few here. I've got like the first like five or six. Uh, we're going to do, we're going to show you some stuff in Postgres 11 versus 12, and you can see the difference. And then uh, once we're done with that, um, I'll probably just close that out and we can focus on some more Postgres 12 stuff, but I think it'll better highlight some of the changes that are in there. Uh, now with most releases, like what you usually hear about, they're sort of big features or things that get, you know, sort of talked up in the marketing press. Um, 12 is a pretty interesting release because a lot of it is is focused on refinement. And that usually is the case for a lot of, uh, you know, for a lot of different, uh, you know, releases that Postgres does. Like some of them add like a new big feature and then other ones are sort of more focused on refinement. And there's a little bit of a mix of all that. So it always makes it a challenge for uh, being able to, you know, put together demos and show things because some things don't really lend themselves to being a visible thing, even though it can be very nice to see it. Um, so we'll go through and, and like I said, I'll show you some of these uh, and then and then we'll kind of get to that. So, um, all right. So we're going to start with just so you can see how this is going to work. Uh, let me jump down to uh, automatically handling extra spaces in to date. Uh, so there's a function in Postgres called to date and uh, and it used to have an issue, and this is one where I'll show you this. Oh, wait, hold on, I'm sorry. Before I set this up, I don't actually have the sample database built. It is really a live demo. Uh, just in case you're wondering, this is a fresh instance. I have no databases here. Let me just create this real quick. You can see it's pretty easy to do. Uh, create database Pajula. So that's created, and then I'm going to jump over there. Uh, and I need uh, Pajula schema. So this is going to load in. And that was pretty quick. So all the tables are there now. Um, and then let me do Pajula data. So we're going to load up a bunch of data. And now we've got data in there. Blah, blah, blah. OK, we're good. Everybody's happy. Um, and you can see the tables are in there. So like I said, actor, address, category, that kind of stuff. Uh, we have a real table or a real database. Uh, I'll leave that alone for now. Okay. So let me show you how this works uh, in Postgres 12. Take the command, run it over here. And this looks like what you would think it was. So basically the function, the purpose of the function is to do formatting on, you know, the data that's being passed in. So we're passing in something that looks like a date, which is October 3rd of 2019. Um, back on the good timeline. Uh, and then we have this formatting that we're putting in, which is these YYs, MMs, DDs. And the feature, if you want to call it that, uh, is that in this formatting, I've got little spaces here, right, between the Ms and the Ys. And it used to be that if you ran that, you would get something that was not correct, basically. It would, it would kind of mungle up your data a little bit. If I run this now, this looks fine. You get back 2019, 1003. And you could then obviously format this uh, in any way that you wanted to to make that work. Uh, but this is one where, like, if I show you what happens if you're doing this in Postgres 11, you'll be horrified um, to see the results that you get back. Uh, so here I actually get back, you know, 0019, 0103. 
And the problem is that because those spaces are in there in older versions of Postgres, it didn't understand what you were trying to put in. Uh, and that's actually a pretty common and easy mistake to make when people are programming these things and trying to make, you know, sort of adaptable on the fly formatting of this stuff. Uh, and the problem is that like, that's, that is actually a valid date, right? Like it's 2000 years ago, but it's a valid date. So if you were putting that into your database, like you're potentially getting mangled up data. So, uh, cause for concern would, would be one way to put that. So those are kinds of those, like those little features that Postgres is always kind of looking to do, uh, and make those work better so that, that those kinds of problems go away. So that's, that's one type of example of that kind of refinement thing, uh, that if you were using to date a lot and you're having that issue just makes it a little bit easier uh, to work with. Um, the next one I want to talk about is OIDs being removed. This is kind of a backwards compatibility thing. Uh, it, uh, we'll go ahead and run this command here. Um, just as an example, I'm going to create a table, single column table with an integer and I'm going to do it with OIDs. I'm going to run that on my Postgres 12 and ah, it gets an error, which is actually what we want because that's the thing. Um, so OIDs have been removed in Postgres 12. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar with OIDs in Postgres, they basically were like an internal uh, kind of special column type that Postgres used to use. And they use this as uh, referring. And I, if I run the same thing, uh, whoops, not that same thing. Uh, if I run this same thing in Postgres 11, you'll see that this will actually work and should be okay. All right. Yeah, so it, as you can see, it created the table. It's fine with that. Um, and generally speaking, you don't really want to use OIDs. Uh, this is kind of a legacy implementation thing and it's, you know, not been, it's been recommended to not use these, I don't know, probably for at least a decade or so. Um, but Postgres was using them internally. Uh, so that was one of the reasons why it hadn't really ever been removed is because the system catalogs in Postgres were using them and they basically use them as, uh, you know, as a an internal kind of like a secret ID column, if you will, uh, for the internal catalog. So if I if I look at uh, something like PG class, so PG class is an internal table. And if I just run that real quick, you see that there's a column called OID in here, uh, and so that is is kind of an identifier, an object identifier for tables in there. So rel name would be like your table name, uh, and OID is like the secret identifier that Postgres is using behind the scenes. If I do that same thing. In uh, in Postgres 11, oh, sorry about that one. So you'll notice that that column is not there, right? We just do rel name, rel namespace, and all that. So it it doesn't quite match up with what we see up here. But it turns out that actually is there. We can do this same query: OID rel name from pgcast limit five, right? So I'm just going to grab five rows out of the table. Now you would expect this to work in 12 because we know the OID column is there and you can see I've got some sequences and tables and that kind of thing. So that so that query works fine with the OIDs, but you can do that same thing actually in 11. Let me grab that again and let's do it in 11 and see it does actually work. There is an OID column uh, and the results look just about the same. It's pretty similar at least, right? So there, it's, it's pretty close. Um, and like I said, these are internal IDs that are used that within the system tables, they reference things. So we had to actually keep that within the system to have Postgres continue to work. The problem is that some people use those for user space tables as well. So they would use these hidden columns uh, for that kind of a thing. And if you are still doing that, it'd be pretty rare uh, to find anyone who is actually still doing that. Um, I, I guess probably not impossible, but... Uh, you know, if you are, actually, I'd be interested in talking to you just to see what the use case is for that. Um, but now we've, it's been changed in 12, so there's no longer a special column. Uh, so you might see those around, but if you try to create your own tables with those, uh, with OIDs as, and that's that special syntax, that will air out and that won't work anymore. So, um, that's been a change in 12. If you're building tooling around databases, like you might run into some issues there. Um, but that's, like I said, that's one of the things, it's a backwards incompatibility issue um, that, that you might run into. Uh, another one I wanted to show, I'm just going to go look for, uh, foreign key naming has also been changed a little bit in uh, in Postgres 12. So this is foreign key names. Uh, they're now named with all columns. I'm going to make a table, and I just want to show you, uh, let me go over here real quick, and I'll show you the film actor table. It's pretty straightforward. 
Um, it's just a simple table. It has an actor ID and a film ID, uh, but it has a dual column primary key, right? Which is combined of the actor and film ID. Uh, and so normally if you were to, or in older versions, I guess, if you were to make a reference to that primary key uh, and you don't explicitly name it, Postgres tries to name it for you. And that's true of most things when it comes to like foreign key names and index names, that kind of thing. Uh, so we've changed the naming a little bit here so you can see the difference. Uh, and I will I actually run this in both places. Uh, on its surface, this will probably look about the same. All right, so we got a create table. That's run there. Uh, nope. <laughs> Sorry. Go back up here and grab that again. And got a create table. So we've created a table on both of these. And so this looks like it's done the same thing, but if I actually show you the table description now, so we've created a foreign key constraint uh, that is called FK naming AF F key, right? So an A column and an F column, which is based on, we created an A column and an F column, and we foreign keyed that to the film actor table, right? For actor ID and film ID. Uh, and I made those sort of hard to read just so they'll fit on the screen, but so hopefully that makes sense. We can look at the same thing over here, um, right? So we'll do the backslash D to show you the foreign key naming. And now you can see here, so the old way, it just really would usually grab the first column and then build the name of that foreign key constraint out of the first column. Uh, and in most cases, this probably doesn't matter. Uh, but the ones where I've seen that this is sort of crumbling up for people is that there, there are some cases where people are doing sort of automated test runs where they're, you know, using CI or something like that. Uh, and then they're building it out and they're going back to verify that the foreign key was created correctly and these names change. So then it breaks their CI runs. Uh, and if you don't realize, you know, it's kind of a, almost an obscure thing to then go look for because actually the command itself worked, right? The foreign keys were built correctly, but it's the name had changed. So if you're testing the output of it to see like, did it get correct? Like, oh, it's not gonna match anymore. So it's simple, right? You just update the output and then your CI will work again. Um, but you know, if you don't know, then you don't know and, and it can take you a while to kind of track something like that down. So um, that's one I like to highlight. And that's, you know, it's always important. Uh, anytime new software comes out, you gotta read the release notes. I know uh, everyone probably always says that, but uh, it's true, it, it is important. Um, let's see, another one here, we've increased the default set of, uh, of full text search languages. Uh, let me just show you that. So for those that don't know, Postgres has a pretty extensive uh, full text search language capabilities. Um, you can do custom dictionaries in different languages and there's all kinds of advanced indexing that's in Postgres that allows you to make that work. And you know, for most people, like we say, and, and we see a lot of startups do this uh, that are, are using Postgres at the beginning, like start with Postgres, like it has most of these kinds of capabilities. You can build quite a bit on top of that. Uh, you know, and then maybe at some point you may need to use an external thing, but in the beginning, like it's usually easiest to just kind of make it all work uh, and just keep using Postgres and have that work. So, um, and in 12, like basically what they did is they said like, we're gonna put more languages just in the system by default. Uh, so here you can see there's just a bunch of them that are in there. Uh, I always like to point out the uh, Irish has been added. Um, I'm not 100% familiar with the Irish language. It is apparently different than Gaelic, I, I guess. Um, but if you speak Irish, then there you go. Um, simple is actually what we normally use. Uh, that's based on the American language because, you know, we're simple, I guess. Um, so, and if I show you this in, in Postgres 11, uh, there just weren't that many that were in there. Uh, so I think we had 16 here. We've got 22 now in Postgres 12. Uh, and there are actually more languages out there. You can go, you know, on the web, like people have created dictionaries and that type of thing. Uh, that you can download and install in Postgres, pretty pluggable in that way. Um, but this makes it a little bit easier. If, if it happened that one of the ones that you needed were one of these ones, um, you know, congratulations, like you've now got it built in. So it's a little bit easier to use uh, going forward. So uh, let me jump into one that's a little bit more complicated of an example. Uh, and I think this will be the last of the 11s that we want to see. Um, let's see if that gives me yeah, common materialized expressions. Uh, so depending on how much you use SQL, you may be familiar with uh, with queries. Um, they're also uh, often called CTEs, which are common table expressions. Uh, and 
the way that the behavior of these queries works has been changed between Postgres 11 and Postgres 12. Uh, and this is another one that it's a little bit different than how Postgres usually handles these kinds of changes because the default behavior has actually changed. And then they give you a way to go backwards. And usually they try to do it the other way around where the default behavior, you know, it's backwards compatible to the old thing. And then if you want to take advantage of something, you know, you use the new flag or keyword or whatever it might be. Um, but let me show you this one really quick. And this is a pretty simple query. You wouldn't really need to do this um, if you were going to do it. But I want to just for, you know, again, for sort of ex uh, explaining it. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, and I'll do this first in Postgres 12. Uh, and I'm going to do an explain. So this is going to show you the query plan because that's really what's going on under the hood, the way Postgres tries to do this. Like the output is going to look the same. Um, but the way that Postgres approaches getting that output has been changed and that has performance implications, you know, and that's why it's kind of important to be aware of what's going on there. Um, so if I do this first, actually, maybe I'll do it. I'll do it the other way around. What the heck? Let's, let's spice it up. Uh, so let me do explain uh, on with a as let me grab all this. All right, so what I'm doing here, just to, to let you know, and the way that this you can think of this conceptually is what Postgres is going to do is it's going to do this with A as select all from actor first. And that means it's going to go grab everything out of the actor table, and it's kind of going to build a result set in memory. Uh, and that's a pretty loose way of describing that, but but close enough for, for these purposes. And then what it does is it says, okay, now that I have that piece of data there, I can use that, and then I can do a select all from A, right, which is what I've labeled my particular with query as, uh, where the first name equals Robert. Uh, and so that will go grab me everybody who's named Robert in there, right? And so if I run this explain plan, you can see what it does is it first grabs everything on the actor table, and there's like 200 rows, uh, and a sequential scan basically means it just went and grabbed every piece of data in there, uh, and then that builds CTEA, which is what I called my my uh, CTE, and then it runs the filter on that data, which is the name uh, looking for anyone named Robert, and then would return a row back, right? And so that makes sense uh, that that's how that would work. Uh, and if I, but if I did, took that same thing, I'm going to run this same query from 11, and I'm going to put it in 12, and you'll see how it actually does it a little bit differently. Right, so what this thing does is, in Postgres 12, it says, well, I could do the query the way that you told me to and and kind of build that result set of the actor table in memory, um, but I actually don't need to do that, and it would be faster if I did not do that, right? And this query is simple enough. One of the reasons I use this query and, and is I want to be simple enough that we can reason about that, that, hey, when you are grabbing all those rows from the actor table, right, when you're doing the sequential scan on actor, uh, you could just look at those rows as you're going through them and grab anyone with their name Robert. And that would be faster than saying, go get me all of, you know, every actor that's in there. And then I'm going to look back through it a second time and find the one that's Robert. Um, I always like to use like the, uh, you know, sorting and dealing with laundry as like my real world example for databases. Uh, where if you, you know, said like, well, I've, I've done the laundry. I need a pair of clean socks. And you said to someone, like, can you go get me a pair of clean socks? Well, if they went and grabbed you all of the clean laundry and the towels and shirts and all that and brought it to you and then said, okay, here's all the things. And then they picked out the pair of clean socks and said, here's the clean socks. You know, you look at that and think, like, that's kind of inefficient. Like, while you were grabbing all the stuff to bring to me, you probably could have just grabbed the socks there and brought just that. So that's basically what Postgres is, is saying. Like, I, I see what you're trying to do, and I can make this faster by just – automatically applying things and not worrying about, you know, breaking this into two parts, the initial select where you've told me to do it in the with query and then where you're actually trying to grab the data. Uh, now, one of the things that's important here and what you see in this demo, um, we have uh, this keyword, which is materialized. So the problem that, that you can run into and in a more complicated query, you will see this is that the reason why one of the reasons why people will use these types of queries is that sometimes it actually is faster to go get, you know, the initial piece of data and then try to do 
some more advanced selects on that piece of data that you've got. Uh, imagine if instead of like select all from actor, like that select had three or four joins in it or something like that. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that you could look at and say, uh, you know, oh, maybe it's faster to go that way. Um, so again, Postgres 12, it gives you a way to do that. And so I'm gonna run that version of the query. And if you look, this gives us the plan that we had back in 11, right? Where it'll go grab everything to build the, the materialized part first, and then it will actually do the filtering. So if you need that old performance behavior, you can still do that. There is a way to make that happen. Uh, and like I said, it's a little bit odd because Postgres usually tries to keep things, you know, the defaults stay the same. And then, you know, if you, if you need a change, you have the keyword, this is the opposite of that. Uh, and so when this first like came into to Postgres, so I saw the commit go into the tree. I was a little bit concerned, I guess is one way to look at it. Um, but I, you know, uh, I work at a company called Creditiv. We do consulting and that kind of stuff. So we basically uh, went and stood up a bunch of Postgres 12s all over the place and took all the CTE queries, that, you know, from a bunch of different customers and ran them to see what happens when you do, uh, you know, when when they make this change. Does this actually hurt performance? Because we knew that one of the reasons we were doing this was for performance benefits. Uh, and what we found, you know, actually was, was pretty good. I would say 90 plus percent of queries in Postgres 12 ended up being faster. Um, most of that was because it just turns out it's generally faster to, to you know, decompose it and put it back together uh, than it is to separate it. Uh, but there's also some other performance benefits in Postgres 12, um, like B-tree indexing has gotten faster, which is pretty critical to almost, you know, 90% of queries you'd run. Um, so that's a thing that's faster now. Uh, so what we found is by and large, you probably don't actually have to worry about this. Most people's queries will be fine and will perform, you know, as good or better than they did in Postgres 11 or, or earlier. Uh, obviously, of course, there is that one or two um, that's probably gonna be hanging out there. So you gotta be careful with that. Uh, but, uh, you know, like I said, as long as you're careful with that, uh, it should work okay. And, and you'll be fine. So um, so that's materialized expressions. Uh, I think that's probably the the end of the ones. Um, oh, and I have both queries in there in case you, in case you want to look at them uh, if you want to run this later at home. Uh, so I'm going to just close out this. Uh, goodbye, Postgres 11. I'm going to close out the whole window. Hopefully we won't need it again. I don't think we do. Uh, and that'll give us a little more space to look at some other things uh, in Postgres 12. So, all right. Um, and in fact, I'll just I'll just start at the next one. Like we can we can kind of do this in any order. Um, if you're if you're looking online at it or something, and you're like, hey, I'd really like to see something specific, feel free to shoot that into the chat. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, I'm just going to head down the list, and and we'll show you um, what we can do. Uh, since we've been talking about explains, uh, let me show you this one. So we're going to do random page costs. This is like an internal setting of Postgres uh, where we do show random page costs. So currently I set it four because this is all the defaults in the config. Um, and this setting itself is not really what's important here. I'm going to just change it to one. Uh, I would, as a general recommendation, you probably want this at two or less. Uh, one is not a horrible idea, um, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, what I want to show you is that explain has a new option where you can see if you pass in this settings on parameter into the explain, uh, it'll actually show you what those settings are. Uh, and so you can see here, it runs explain, it gives me that back, but then it tells me, hey, your settings, you have random page cost equal to one. Uh, and that's really nice for, you know, when you're doing performance analysis and trying to do query tuning, um, a lot of times you can be changing multiple parameters within a session and just remembering which ones you've changed and which ones you have and, and if it's different or not, um, you know, it's nice to be able to have an option to show you that. So uh, that's another little thing that that's nicer to see. Um, forced plan cache mode. All right, we'll do this one. Uh, show plan cache mode. This is a little bit of an odd one. I don't think too many people run into this, but it, it's, you know, it, it's something to be aware of. Um, so plan cache mode in, in Postgres, uh, sort of a, I think a not terribly well-known thing. If you're using prepared statements, um, the number of times that you actually run a prepared statement will change how Postgres's behavior is. Uh, and so I'm gonna show you here. So we've got it in auto mode, which is, is kind of the default. Uh, I'm gonna make an index on a table and, that created, that's fine, that was pretty quick. Uh, 
Uh, and then I'm going to prepare a query. And I, again, the particular query is not super important. Um, but just so you know the syntax here, so prepare means basically it, it's not going to run the query. It's just going to go and, and basically plan that query. Uh, and then I have to give it a name and sort of a result. Like this is what it's going to look like. Uh, and then this is the query that it's going to take, right? And what I'm passing in, uh, you know, if you've heard of like parameterized queries, I'm passing in a parameter for it. And that's going to be a numeric uh, that I'm going to pass in as the amount, which is going to be string one. So let me go ahead and just prepare that. So when I go back and want to execute this, um, right, I just have to pass in sort of the name and, and what the value is. Right, and so it prepared, you can see that there. And then now let me show you this a few times here. We're gonna do, uh, I'm gonna pass this in. So I'm gonna execute. So first you prepare the statement, then you're gonna execute it. So I'm executing uh, EX for example, and then just passing in the number 499 as my price. Uh, so based on grabbing every payment where the amount you know was equal to 499 uh, is what I'm doing. But I'm using prepared statements as a way to do it. Um, so and you can see here, it uses an index scan with a condition. Uh, hey, it's still showing me my random page cost is one. Uh, hopefully that didn't break anything. I don't think it will. The magic of, of the live demo. Uh, let me do another one. Uh, here I'm passing in 1199. Uh, and what you can see is, uh, right, so here we go. We pass in a different amount and it uses the index again. So now what I wanna do is I'm gonna set Enable bitmap scan off. It's going to change how the plan works, uh, or at least I believe it's supposed to. We'll see what happens. All right, so that is off. And let me run these again and see if anything has changed. Uh, let's see, we got off here, index scan using, uh, passing that in, index condition 499. And we'll do it again with 11.99. I know you're like, where's he going with this? We'll see. We'll see. Uh, index scan again. Now I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna change the plan cache mode to force generic plan. And what that means is uh, just trying to keep it at a high level. But so when Postgres is doing this planning, right? It's using the same plan for these two amounts, the 4.99 and the 11.99. But what is tricky is that depending on the amount that you passed in, right, you might have more or less rows that would normally come back. And so the way you would go about getting this data, uh, you know, could be better or worse depending on the plan that's been generated. Um, and so you have now ability up front to sort of force a generic plan, which is to say, if I were to, maybe a different example would be if I were to do something like a true and a false table where, you know, 90% of the rows were true and 10% were false. In that case, using an index to get the false rows at 10% would probably be a good plan. Uh, but that might be a bad plan for getting the 90% of true rows, right? And if I'm just doing prepares and executes, it's basing the plan that I should be using off of what I'm passing in rather than what the data is itself. Uh, so let's see if we force that. Let's see if we get something different here. Index scan. Ooh, we got all kinds of settings going on. This might be actually a little bit off. Ooh. But let's see what it tells us over here. Oh, it gave us the same thing. Uh, let me set that back on and see if it has changed. And I gotta explain with 11.99. So now I'm turning bitmap scan back on. And did we get a different one? I think we got the same one. Ah, the demo gods, they've come after me. Index scan using index, yeah. Enable bitmap scan. Looks like we got the same one. Although, I do want you to notice, uh, let's see here. So up here, we're seeing the amount is 1199 uh, and these original ones, amount 499. So when it's doing its execution, it's doing that based off of the 499 uh, and the 1199. And if you look at these ones down here where we've changed it, uh, you see the amount is dollar one, which is basically telling you, hey, I've used a generic plan on this, not the data that you passed in, in order to get the answer that I've gotten, right? And if I switch this back, I believe we should see it the other way. Demo gods are 
giving me some side eye though, I feel. Yeah. One of the fun things about doing this is that uh, the order in which you do these demos can actually affect later demos. So it's always fun. Ah, but we did get it back. Woohoo! I feel feel a little bit better. Um, so that's one. It's worth playing around with if you use prepared queries, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, or if you think that might be something useful. Usually where people do that, you know, it's when you know you have certain, like, very specific queries that you're going to be running a lot uh, and you want to take the planning time out, especially on something that would be, you know, really, really fast. Uh, where you're trying to, to really get into some, some deep performance stuff. So, um, let me show you another one, it's sort of a simple one. It's actually my favorite feature. So sort of keeping one eye on the time here and I don't want to get too far without hitting this one. Um, and it's, it's kind of sad maybe that this is one of my favorite features for 12, uh, but, but it is. Uh, so, and it, you know, it is what it is. So, um, one of the things with, uh, Postgres, if you run Postgres for any amount of time, you probably end up doing a re-index at some point. Uh, and the reason, uh, and what re-indexes is everyone generally with database, you're familiar with indexes. Um, you know, uh, you build an index on a particular column, uh, that makes it fast to look up the data in there. Uh, but what happens is usually over time, there's a lot of inserts and updates that are going on. And so you can end up with what Postgres called bloat in the index, which is basically like dead space in the index where rows have been removed and they haven't been able to reuse that space for some reason or another. Uh, and then the way you fix that, usually is you you can re-index that index, uh, which basically just means, hey, go build the index again. Um, but the problem is that when you do that, you actually need kind of a heavyweight lock on it to build the index. Uh, and so it blocks inserts or updates to the table while it's doing the re-index. And that's generally not good if people don't like that. Uh, so the workaround that most folks do at the moment is instead of re-indexing an index, they just create an entirely new index because create index has a concurrently option, which allows you to do the index build while inserts and updates are happening concurrently. But re-index did not have that option. So Postgres 12 finally gives us that option. Uh, and so let me show you the syntax here real quick. Um, if I just do a backslash H on re-index, you can see here, command re-index, it rebuilds indexes. And then the super magic secret sauce here is this concurrently keyword, you can pass that in uh, and it will uh, do it while you're actually, uh, you know, have inserts or updates going on. Uh, and I'll show you how this looks. Like, it's not really much to look at because uh, it's just, you know, it's a re-index. So it's just going to say that. Um, I'm going to pass in the verbose flag so you can see what's going on. Uh, it was re-indexed. It was re-indexed. Yeah, there's not much to look at. Like, and that's what they're like, it's not much to demo, but if you're doing Postgres DBA work, like this is, you know, it's sad, but this will be a reason that you will want, you probably can't convince your boss to upgrade to 12 for this reason, but as a DBA, you would definitely want to upgrade to 12. I think just for, for this command, um, it just makes things uh, easier, even though it's, it seems like a small thing. Um, it's a really nice one uh, to me. Um, let me go up this time. I want to show you create aggregate, which is another new change in command. Uh, let me show you the syntax for it first. Uh, this is similar to re-index, but just not as common in usage. Uh, I'll show you the, we now have the option to do create or replace on an aggregate. Uh, and the reason this is nice, people probably don't remember, because uh, I think this is one that goes back like 10 years. It used to be like when you created a function in Postgres, if you wanted to change the function, you'd have to drop it, you know, and, and recreate the function. Uh, which that, that could be annoying. Well, aggregates kind of have worked that way up until now, um, that if you need to change something about the definition of your aggregate, uh, you basically would have to drop the aggregate and then, you know, sort of rebuild it. And that can lead to issues, you know, if you're using that in a function or in a view or something like that, uh, or like a table column or an index, uh, you know, try dropping an aggregate where you're doing some kind of indexing thing. Um, or whatever, right? Like there's just some examples where that leads to dependency trees and so it causes issues. So now you don't have to do it that way. You can just do a replace. And aggregates, uh, it's, you know, there's a lot of different ways actually to build aggregates in Postgres. So this is like the help syntax is one of the more complicated ones that comes up first. There's actually other versions of it. Uh, like if you're using C code to build your aggregate uh, or whatnot. Um, so you can see there's different ones in there. Uh, and so now, but any of those will work. You can just do create or replace and it'll take the existing syntax and just change what is necessary uh, and then go ahead and make it. Um, one of the other things I like to point out is uh, new in Postgres 12. Um, they've added these little URL helpers 
Uh, and Korean aggregate is definitely one where that's helpful. Uh, and what these are is basically when you do a help command within PSQL, uh, it, it gives you the URL to the online documentation where you can find out more about that particular command. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a nice, again, a nice little feature just to make it a little bit easier. Um, and I, I mentioned this with create aggregate because obviously like the command itself, here's the old syntax is kind of complicated. Here's one version of the syntax. There's a third version of the syntax. So depending on what you're doing with aggregates, uh, you know, you can have some pretty complicated stuff in there. Um, I will note that those links are hard coded to the version of PSQL. So if you're using a PSQL from a Postgres 12 instance and you're trying to connect to, uh, you know, Postgres uh, 11 or 10 or something, you know, PSQL is generally backwards compatible. This is one case where it'll still link you to the, the version 12 uh, of that documentation. So, and there's links, you know, if, if you've seen the online docs, there's a link to just get to whatever version you need to get to. So it's not a big inconvenience, but it's just a minor thing that like, don't forget when you click on that link, you may not actually be seeing the version that you're on. So there could be differences there. Um, so, all right, let's see what else we got here. Uh, Oh uh, yeah, friendlier config size. That's kind of nice little one. Uh, and this one actually could be practical. Um, this demo is not, but, uh, but it should get it across. Um, so this is a basic, you know, running on my desktop, uh, Postgres instance. The maintenance work mem is set to 64. Uh, it's just the default, which is size based on the amount of, uh, you know, memory and, and whatnot that I have on this particular machine. Uh, and Postgres, I mean, it's pretty good. It scales up and down you know, hardware wise, uh, pretty well, uh, and whatnot. But, um, so I have this set at 64 megs. Uh, if I wanted to do something and I'm not sure why I would want this particular number, but, uh, we now have the ability to use things like decimals in there. Um, so I can do like 21.12 megabytes. Uh, yeah, let me just run that. Uh, and so it'll actually accept this syntax, whereas that would have caused an error, uh, in the past and where I think it's probably more useful is if you're trying to do, you know, like let's say you need like four and a half gigs or something like that. Um, in the past, it wouldn't have, it, you know, wouldn't accept 4.5 gigabytes. Like it would have actually complained. Uh, and so you'd have to work that out in, in megabits. Um, and let me just show you, it actually is doing that behind the scenes for you. So it isn't storing it the way that you've said. Uh, it's actually storing it, right, as KB, even though, it showed me originally as, as 64 megs because it was a nice round number. Now that I've put this weird decimal in there, I don't know how much 0.12 uh, megabits is. Uh, I don't know. But it works out to, I guess it's probably about 600-ish. Um, so it's actually storing it in the way it needs to be. And it used to be you'd have to do that conversion yourself. Uh, and so, you know, if you can prevent somebody from doing math, uh, I think most people end up being happy with that. So um, let's see. We did foreign key naming. Uh, some new system views. These are nice. Oh man. Uh, especially that second one. Uh, let me just show you. If you, if you're working on an existing Postgres now, um, there's this one called PG stat progress vacuum, uh, which is available. And what this does is so, so Postgres, uh, depending on how familiar you are with it, it has this vacuum process that runs in the background. Um, you can kind of think of it like garbage compaction, uh, that, that you see in, uh, you know, programming languages, uh, where there's, inserts and updates that are going on to the database. Uh, those run and, and do what they do. Uh, and then, you know, every now and then Postgres fires off a, a worker that goes and cleans up afterwards. So, and that's called the vacuum process. Um, so uh, one of the problems that you have with that is that it's really hard to see what the vacuum process is actually doing in older versions. Uh, and I think PG stat progress vacuum, I think it came in in Postgres 10. Uh, and what it basically would show you is like, well, here's the current state of what your vacuum is doing, right? Is it scanning the table or is it working on indexes or whatever? Uh, and so that was a really nice feature. Uh, gives you a lot more insight into what's going on. If you're like, is this vacuum even doing anything? You know, like then, then you could go look in here and you could collect this data over time and then model out like how long do vacuums take and all that kind of stuff. Um, the one that I really liked, uh, so they, they've added one now for cluster. So if you're clustering a table, uh, which is in, in Postgres lingo, when you cluster a table, it's basically you rewrite the table in the order of a specific index, right, that, that you choose. So it's almost the same thing. You you know, in the vacuum one, you had your process ID, the database, the relation that it was around, so like the table it was on, the OID type, because uh, those are still OIDs. 
uh, like what phase of vacuum it was in. If you're clustering, it's almost the same thing. You still got, there's a process idea that's running on the system someplace, right? What database are you in? What's the table that you're in? Uh, what was the command that was run, right? What phase of the cluster is it in? That kind of stuff. Um, so that's in there. What What is more useful because the problem with clustering is it takes heavyweight locks to actually do it. So people don't do it all that often. Um, create index is definitely one that people do much more often. Uh, when you're building an index, especially, you know, as you start to get in those 100 gigabyte, uh, terabyte size tables, uh, creating an index can take a while. And so knowing what is going on is, is a nice thing. So um, again, this one very similar, what's the process ID? And you can match that to like PG stat activity and take a, you know, see what's going on there. What's the table that's going on? Uh, what is the index that you're building, right? What was the command? What phase of index building it is, right? Because when you're building an index, like you're going to go grab all the data and you got to sort the data and then you actually rewrite it back out in the index. So there's different parts to that index build that happen. Uh, so they've added some more system views so you can see what's actually going on in there. Um, and I think, trying to keep an eye on the time here. I think we got about five more minutes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so let's see, uh, we did create an ID. Let me look through the list and see what is interesting. Um, let's do maybe PSQL tricks is good. Uh, well, I copy with where clause. Let's do copy with where clause. Well, let's not do copy with where clause. Uh, let's do pluggable storage. Let me do this one just because I think a lot of people heard about this and they're kind of curious about it. Uh, and it's not, I don't know. Well, let me get into it and then we'll do PSQL tricks and then maybe we'll do like JSON path. Uh, and that probably will take all the time. Uh, so this one, I just want to touch on this real briefly because there's been talk about Postgres doing pluggable storage engines. Um, that is a thing that is coming, but I would say in the current, uh, system, you know, in Postgres 12 is the first version that has this. And really what has been added, it's not that they've actually added pluggable storage engines yet. What they're starting to do is put the machinery in in order to do pluggable storage engines. Um, so there was actually a talk, uh, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before, I went to the folks at VMware are building a new storage engine called ZStore, uh, which is going to plug into Postgres. And it, it's more of like a columnar storage type. Uh, and so the first pieces of that are in Postgres 12. Um, if you're into that or that's the thing that you think you want to do, um, you know, maybe it is worth going to look at 12. If you're just consuming this as a user and you're thinking like, oh, let me go, um, you know, let me go use these new Postgres plugin methods. Uh, that's really not going to work at this point. Uh, so it's really at this point, it's still kind of at the developer level that, that you'd see that. Uh, but just so you see what they're talking about, uh, here's the help command within PSQL, create a new access method uh, and the type and what the handlers are. And then there's, you know, links in the docs. Um, if I showed you like a particular table, let me show you the actor table. Uh, and, uh, oh, I think I have this hidden at the moment. So here's the actor table description. Um, where's my trigger? Yeah, let me set hide table am on and run that again. Oh, let me set that off then. Let's see. I feel like I missed it. Uh, it should actually be in here, and I don't see it. I feel confused. It's demos for you. Uh, so there's ways to see this, um, even though I can't prove it to you. So I'm probably just lying. Uh, but I would swear it'll tell you. So you can see uh, there's a default one in there, which is heap, which is what it uses now. So if you look for that, uh, you'll see heap. Let's do a backslash DA and see what that gives us. Um, here's access methods at the moment. What's interesting is most of the ones at the moment are actually index access methods, right? Because Postgres is built on this really pluggable engine. Uh, so right now, what most people have done is done pluggable index types. Uh, so most people, like when you just make an index by default, you get a B tree index. Um, but there's all different kinds, you know, Brin and Gin and just like if you're doing full text search, usually just or Gin indexes are what you want. Uh, and so we have this one table method, which is called the heap. Um, so any table that you look at in a Postgres 12 now uh, would just be a heap uh, type unless you've done some magic patching or something. Um, so heap is the name of the current one. Um, Z store is the one that VMware is working on. Uh, I think Z heap is one that is being worked on by uh, EDB. Um, and so, you know, there's ones that are out there that I think that are coming. 
uh, and just be aware of that, that, that that's a thing. Uh, but if you were getting ready to jump into that on Postgres 12, like that's not really a thing yet, unless you want to do it from the developer level. So, um, I'll show you a couple other PSQL tricks. I don't know how many people use PSQL. Like it's, it's in the Postgres world, uh, it's by far, you know, one of the heaviest used tools is still the command line tool. Um, there's a lot of different GUIs out there. I don't think the community is really, you know, congealed on a particular one. Um, here's con info. Uh, if you just want to see what your connection is, you're connected to database Pajila, user Postgres, using temp socket on that port. Um, the funny part is like, there was no real way to see this from within PSQL. So it doesn't seem like a big thing. Uh, I have sort of this customized, uh, you know, uh, prompt setup so I can see some of that info because it's good to know what user you are, like what database you're connected to. Um, let me show you this other one, PSET format CSV. Uh, PSET kind of controls how the output from PS, uh, PSQL works. Uh, and so I'm just going to do this example, select all from actor element five. Uh, and what you can see is that what I've come up with is I'm basically getting uh, CSV data here. Uh, right? Because I set the format to CSV. So it, it just gave me my five rows back. Like here's the column names. Uh, and then here's the data. Right. And by default, uh, the format that, that it uses is called aligned. So I'm going to set this back to the default. And then uh, I'll just run that same query. And you can see what it would look like in a non CSV format. So um, that could be really nice. Like you could use that with something like backslash O uh, and which outputs to a file and then do a select uh, of CSV. And then you'd have the data as CSV uh, if you wanted to do something quick and dirty in, in PSQL. Um, what the heck? We might as well look at label partition tables. Uh, I have a partition table in here. Uh, backslash D payment. Um, some of the things it's showing is down here, the number of partitions, uh, it has six partitions. Again, it's like a little thing to see like how many partitions are on this table. And then you can use D plus to list them out, uh, if you want to. Um, here's another, like a little one. This one actually is probably gonna change the way some people manage their systems. Uh, in Postgres, when you set up uh, a standby system, right? So you have like a primary and then like secondary or, or what have you, um, uh, used to be that you had to have some method to, to like touch a file on the file system in order to actually promote the standby to become the new primary. Uh, so you needed file level access to that. And what, what has happened is in Postgres 12, they've added this function PG promote. Uh, and basically what it does is you, you know, you can pass in how long to wait, but it promotes the standby. So you run it on the standby and it promotes it into a primary. Um, now, obviously, that's not going to handle, you know, if you have to reroute your applications or whatever, that that's outside the bounds of this. Um, but it means that you can do this from the database level. You don't actually have to have file system level access. Uh, so, on, you know, for some people, they're like, oh, my God, finally, like, I can't, you know, I've been waiting for that for years. Uh, why did it take so long? Other people probably are horrified of like, wait, anyone who connects to my database? And it's like, no, there's a little, you know, there's some restrictions around it. Um but on the other hand, if you're the kind of person who lets all your apps connect as the Postgres user, uh, I would obviously never connect as a Postgres user. I always make some other user and then do it that way. Uh, I'm sure you do as well. Um, so um, what do we got? We got, I think, about maybe two or three more minutes here. Um, I don't know if anyone had a thing they wanted to see. Let me look at some of the, the options in there. I think we gain in terms of geo database. Oh, there is actually. Um, let me show you. Oh boy, I have to remember the. I think we're about done. There is a thing. Um, uh, there's an example in here. It is on. Uh, let's see, country. There it is. That's that's what I need to look for. Um, not that one though. Yeah, this one here. Uh, so there's a thing. I, I I think we're about out of time here. So. Um, I'm not going to walk you through it, but just so you know, there is an example in there if you want to look at it. Uh, so we have this thing, create statistics for multiple columns. Um, you can do uh, multivariate column statistics now to do things. And the, what this example shows you is basically looking at like cities and countries. And in Postgres, when you're doing like, and we see this a lot with geo-oriented work, um, 
when you're doing that kind of thing, Postgres sometimes gets very confused about like, oh, these two columns have a relationship, but I don't know that it actually has a relationship. Uh, and so this way uh, you can actually tell Postgres, you create a statistic, uh, and here I just called it geo points, but you create a statistic telling it these two have a relationship and then it will grab data about that and then use that when it does query planning. Um, so that's one of the nice things for, for PostGIS users that we see. So um, I think I'm actually out of time. Uh, somebody yell at me if, if I am not. Um, but I will be over in the Slack channel here momentarily. Uh, and if you have questions or whatever I want to ask there, uh, we can definitely do, do things there. So um, other than that, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, and uh, like I said, if you have any questions, happy to answer them. Feel free to download this, play around with it, uh, learn you know as much as you can, and uh, and keep going. So, let me jump back here. All right. Uh, any last questions, comments? Nope. I guess we're good. All right. Thanks, everyone.